right, would you, while you still have uh, your Bibles in front of you, would you go ahead and turn to Hebrews chapter 9? Hebrews chapter 9, I'll try to make some of the connective tissue between the text that was just read to us from Romans and our passage this morning, which will be a continuation of our series in the book of Hebrews. We're going to look at the first uh, 10 verses of Hebrews chapter 9 together. Hebrews 9 verses 1 through 10. We'll turn our attention there in just a moment. I think it will make everyone in the room feel better if we put this in the context of your teenage years. So I want you to think back about a time when you were a teenager and you did something wrong. I know none of you did something wrong in your teenage years, but just imagine it was the case. You might not have called it sin, but you know you stepped out of bounds. There was no denying the fact. How did you feel? The reality is most of us, Christian, non-Christian alike, have a sense of an awareness when we step out of bounds that creates a set of emotions in us. We feel bad, ashamed, embarrassed, icky, right? gross. All these terms fit. What's interesting is what comes next. Uh, We won't use the terms of our passage this morning, right now. We'll we'll simply say, when when you feel that way, there's a sense of, I've got to get clean. It's like uh, doing yard work on a summer Saturday, right? You're disgusting and you know it. And you've got to get the gross off. Here's the reality. People simply cannot live, at least for long, with the shame and guilt of their wrongdoing. Like a splinter, sin, wrongdoing festers under the surface, and we've got to find some way to get it out. So think back to your teenage years. What are the things that you did to try to get the gross out? Some of you can probably think back of some pretty odd things that you did to deal with the shame and guilt of your sin as a teen. Perhaps it's a bunch of good deeds, right? Maybe if I just do enough good, it will kind of shift the weight, the balance, and, and, and God will assess and say, well, you yeah, know, kind of placate him. I did enough good to, to get by. Or perhaps you in your mind tried to minimize the bad thing that you had done, right? If you could convince yourself mentally that what you did wasn't actually that bad, then the gross will go away. Or many times we try to size ourselves up to our competitors, right? If my gross isn't as bad as the gross of somebody else, then I'm good. No big deal. Or maybe you told someone, which for most of us means you kind of half told them about the thing that you kind of sort of did. And somehow kind of sort of telling somebody about the kind of sort of thing that you kind of did makes you feel a little bit less worse, less bad about the thing that you know you had done wrong. Now, I'll say it's easier for us to envision this in our teenage years because it's uh, a bit softer and further back there for most of us. But you know you don't outgrow this tendency when you leave your teenage years. The issue doesn't stop. We've got to find a solution to deal with a nagging voice inside of us that tells us we are sinners. The Bible has a term for this voice. It's used in Romans 2, and it's used in our text this morning, and it's the conscience. The conscience is often pictured as this uh, angel sitting on your shoulder, right? But perhaps better understood, we might define it simply as this, is a God-given sense of right and wrong. A God-given innate ability inside of humans that defines what is in bounds and what is out of bounds, and specifically... That brings conviction when you transgress. For example, in 1 Kings 22, King Solomon uses the the phrase, speaking of another king, he says, they knew in their hearts that what they had done is wrong. Okay, This might be the sense that we're getting at. The conscious knows in our hearts that we're wrong. It knows it, it acts, it speaks, it haunts us, it forces us to figure out what are we going to do with our sin. As we've been moving through the book of Hebrews, we've seen this steady contrast between the old covenant system and the new covenant that comes through Christ. And in our passage this week, the speaker is going to grapple with the limitations of the old system in addressing the conscious and present the better way that is found through Christ. 
I'll read, you follow along as I'll read, we'll read the entirety of the text this morning. So Hebrews 9, verses 1 to 10. Now the first covenant had regulations for ministry and earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was set up, and in its first room, which is called the holy place, where the lamp stand at the table and the presentation loaves. Behind the second curtain was a tent called the most holy place. It had a gold altar of incense and an ark of the covenant covered with gold on all sides, in which was a gold jar containing the manna, Aaron's staff that budded, the tablets of the covenant. The cherubim of glory were above the ark, overshadowing the mercy seat. It's not possible to speak in detail about these things right now. With these things prepared like this, the priest entered the first room repeatedly, performing their ministry, but the, the high priest alone enters the second room, and he does that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people, the sins the people had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was making it clear that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed while the first tabernacle was still standing. This is a symbol for the present time during which gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the worshiper's conscience. There are physical regulations that only deal with food and drink and various washings that were imposed until the time of the new order. It's back to school time, so... I know back to school, uh, kids love math, so I figured we would uh, introduce this morning's text with a little math problem, our outline this morning. Ten verses that present the limitations of this first covenant system. A physical place, tangible symbols, and a human mediator equal temporary relief. A physical place, a, a, a structure... With tangible symbols inside, in which a human mediates worship, it provides something, but that something is temporary relief. Let's take each of these in turn. And let's take them from the perspective of a random Israelite. We'll pick a fictitious name. Let's call him Jacob. That sounds like a good name for random Israelite, right? Jacob knows that he's a sinner. He knows that he's broken God's law. He knows this because he's, he's heard God's law as an Israelite, and because by virtue of his conscience, he knows he's rebelled. But he knows he's a sinner in one other significant way. Every day he wakes up and he gets out of his tent in the wilderness and he sees something like, like this. Every day. He gets out and notices the center of the, the, the place, wherever the Israelites have settled, looks something like this, the, 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 the uh, Eiffel Tower, as it were. The defining place is a giant moving tent called the Tabernacle. Jacob, our fictitious Israelite, would have had his tent set up in the wilderness alongside others in his tribe. But every morning he would see this Tabernacle. And he wouldn't have to do anything to have a vivid reminder of two things by virtue of this physical place. He would be reminded every single day that he was a sinner. That he was in need of forgiveness. And secondly, he would be reminded that there was a God who was willing to forgive. Every day, Jacob, by virtue of the physical place, would have a reminder that he was a sinner, number one, in need of forgiveness, and number two, that there was a God who was willing to forgive. And he would know this by virtue of seeing the physical structure. He would see the smoke. He would hear the cries of the animals. He would smell the blood. There was no escaping the tabernacle. And specifically here, it's not just any structure. It's not set up in any way that the people wanted. God gave extensive instructions for how this would be set up. Exodus 25 through 30 are the most extensive of these instructions, six chapters, where God precisely outlines, here's the, the type of tabernacle I want you to build. Here's where I'm going to dwell among my people. And what made the tabernacle significant was not merely the precise nature of the construction, but the fact that God's glory was there. This is where God dwelt with his people. Exodus 40, 34 through 38, 38, in the commemoration of this, the cloud covered the tent of meeting, another name for the tabernacle. 
And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses was unable to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud rested on it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. God was there in this physical place. And Jacob, knowing that God was there, knowing that he was a sinner, he could then, idea number two, bring his worship to this God in the form of sacrifices. And these would be handled through tangible symbols. In our text, verses 2 and following outline some of these symbols. We would see, perhaps, can you throw up the second picture? Yes, some, some construction like this, I think the image gets at uh, the idea here. This first outer area containing at least three significant symbols that are mentioned in the text. The lampstand, the table, and the presentation loaves. It's unclear exactly what each of these represented, but taken together, they're a symbol of God's presence. God is among his people. Think of the warning given to the churches in the book of Revelation. I'm going to take my lampstand from you. In other words, I'm going to take my presence from among you. God provided light for his people, and he met their needs at the table. And then specifically here in Hebrews 9, mention is made of the curtain. This ornate curtain that separated what is the holy place from the most holy place. And inside that most holy place were some items as well, some tangible symbols. Again here, the symbols are symbolic of God's faithfulness to his people. Notice what's mentioned there. An altar made of gold, incense, the ark, a jar of manna, Aaron's budding staff, the tablets of the law. And then specifically, the speaker, the author of Hebrews, says there's an ark. And on that ark set symbols, angels, cherubim, who rested over the mercy seat, the place where blood would be sacrificed or sprinkled. The imagery of the curtain and the angels is a clear pointer, isn't it, back to the Garden of Eden. Where you might remember God cast Adam and Eve out from his presence due to their sin. And what did he do? He posted cherubim. That would guard the way back in. In other words, sinners could not come back to God any way they wanted. They could only come in the way God prescribed. This picture, these pictures of God's faithfulness, would, uh, Jacob would hand off his sacrifices and the priest would take them into these places. Now, as a bit of an aside... If you read the end of verse 5, and I take this, uh, the book of Hebrews, as one collective sermon, I think the speaker is saying here, hey dudes, I got a 35-minute shot clock counting down in the back, and I ain't got time to tell you more about this right now. We're going to have to keep moving here, okay? So that's what we're going to do with the text as well. I got more details that I could describe about this, but we don't have time to consider them. What's important, thirdly, is that these offerings would be mediated by a mere human. They would be handled by by a person. Verses 6 and 7. Mention is made of of two people, two subgroups. The bigger group, the priest, they perform their ministry in this kind of outer space, the holy place. And then the high priest, who alone goes into the holy of holies. And even there, the high priest could only go at an appointed time and in appointed ways very specific plan that God had spelled out. Notice in verse 7, he's offering sacrifice for sins committed in ignorance. This language in the New Testament, Acts 17, is often used to, to describe sins that were committed before the time, before the coming of Christ. Before we knew fully what we would do with sins, this time of ignorance. It's also describing the general category of sin. We think of sins as something we do or something that we don't do. But here the author points out that we need sacrifice for sins committed in ignorance. Frailty is such that sometimes we sin without even knowing that we sinned, knowing that we've done wrong. But then he acknowledges a critical point, and he's going to double-click on this point as chapters 9 and 10 progress. Notice, the priest had to offer sacrifices for himself too. Why? Because he's merely a human. 
because he has a guilty conscience as well. He's culpable of the very sins that he's sacrificing for. He's guilty too. Which brings us to the problem. And this is the highlight in verses 8 through 10. Let's reread. The Holy Spirit was making it clear. What was he making clear? How was he making clear? Through this physical symbol, this physical place, with tangible symbols that was mediated by a mere person, that the way into the holy place had not yet been disclosed while the first tabernacle was still standing. This is a symbol for the present time during which gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the worshiper's conscience. They are physical regulations that only deal with food and drink and various washings imposed until the time of the new order. If we were to summarize those three verses, what's the issue? Well, all of this only provides temporary relief. All all of this, all of this under the first covenant, verse 1, or until the time of the new order, verse 10. Only provides temporary relief. In chapter 10, the author is going to speak of these as shadows of something that was to come. He says in verse 8, the Holy Spirit was active in these symbols and shadows, making it clear that something wasn't right. The conscious was not perfected. Some of your translations there in verse 9 are going to say, this. it couldn't clear the worshiper's conscience. You might imagine old Jacob waking up on the Day of Atonement, Leviticus uh, 16, and saying... Here we go again. Once again, I've got to get up on this day, and I've got to bring my sacrifice, and I've got to confess my sins, and I've got to watch a mere human perform an act that once completed is only going to have to be done again and again. Jacob goes to bed on the night of atonement thinking, Phew, I'm glad that's over. And ugh, I've got to do it again. You might imagine the emotion you get after cutting grass or washing clothes or cleaning the house, right? The preacher in the book of Hebrews has a good news, has good news for Jacob's. And he's going to spell those out in chapters 9 and 10. The new covenant provides much better math. The new covenant that comes through Christ provides a much better math problem for us. Because it prevents, presents to us a physical, a, a spiritual place in contrast to the physical place of old. Through a substitutionary sacrifice made by the God-man, Jesus Christ. So the temporary relief in the old order comes through a, 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 a physical place with tangible symbols where the sacrifice is offered by a mere human. The new covenant that comes through Christ pictures a spiritual place where sacrifices are made through a substitutionary offering made by the God-man, Jesus Christ. Look in verse 8. He points forward to a way into the most holy place. Now that's odd, isn't it? I mean, clearly he's not talking about the actual most holy place. Because they know how to get there. There's been instructions that, that's spelled out for them. They do it year after year. That place had been made clear. But the way to the true most holy place was not yet revealed. What wasn't possible under the, the old order was for the average Israelite to enter the most holy place. And it wasn't possible for anyone to stay in the most holy place. So everybody couldn't get there, and nobody could stay there. That's a big problem. So the way to the true most holy place could not come through the tabernacle or through the more permanent temple that would follow. But now the speaker is going to say, Jesus has come. And now that he's completed his work, the way into the true most holy place is now disclosed. And this way into the true most holy place isn't a physical map to a new location, but it's a person. John's Gospel in John 2 through 4 is going to highlight many of these themes. Remember Jesus saying, what I 
and the way, the truth, and the life. The, the way is Jesus. He is the path to God. In John 2, Jesus pictures himself as the tabernacle and the temple in a way that the hearers of his day don't understand. Jesus says, destroy this temple, and I will raise it in three days. And the Jews say, this temple took us 46 years to build. How are you going to raise it in three days? But Jesus was speaking of the temple of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture that Jesus has made. The new way to the most holy place is through Christ. It's in Christ. It's the tabernacle of Christ. And in John 4, Jesus describes the worship that's going to be offered to God, not at this physical location, but as you might remember with the woman at the well, through the Spirit and in truth. Do you remember what he says in John 4? Believe me, woman, an hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you don't know. We worship what we do know because salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Yes, the Father wants such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. All those who come to him in saving faith then can now offer true worship in the most holy place through Christ. And in a stunning picture, the torn curtain rent at Jesus' death makes a way possible for all Christians Now to draw near with confidence. Remember the words back from Hebrews 4? Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we can receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Now you might imagine our fictitious Jacob hearing those words and being stunned. This is unheard of. I mean, Jacob had never seen the Holy of Holies. In fact, he would not even imagine trying to go in and take a peek for himself. And now, because of Jesus, the speaker is saying, not only can I go, but I can have confidence to approach the very throne of God. How? Through a substitutionary sacrifice. I'll provide limited commentary here because this is the focus of the rest of the chapter, so next week's sermon. But in verse 9, the speaker mentions these old covenant realities as symbols. And perhaps the most important symbol you notice in verses 1 through 10 is somebody never comes without blood. The symbol was made clear, this is made clear because the speaker is going to point to this at the end of the chapter, look in 9.22, kind of the famous culmination of this chapter. Without the shedding of blood, There is no forgiveness of sins. So how do you get there? You get there through a blood sacrifice. Now the idea has fallen on hard times in modern culture. Blood sacrifices are thought to be antiquated and no longer necessary. Many presume that society is advanced such that we find forgiveness in other ways. I find forgiveness through being a good person. I find forgiveness through love. I find... Forgiveness through advocacy for the oppressed, or forgiveness through authenticity. Surely we not discount the value of love or kindness of deeds of mercy or righteous acts. But the speaker is clear. Forgiveness with God does not come by any of those means. Forgiveness comes to us on a path of blood. That is the only way it is received. And whose blood? The God-man, Jesus Christ. The blood that makes it possible for us to draw near in a spiritual place to the throne is offered by Christ. What's astonishing about the blood of Christ is that he doesn't have to make purification for himself. Why? Because he's not culpable of the sins for which he's offering the sacrifice for. He has no sacrifice to offer for his sins but only for the sins of others. As Peter writes, Christ also suffered once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, what? That he might bring us to God. This 
makes Jesus' work a once-for-all act. Jesus does what the first covenant cannot do, and that is he makes a way for something far greater than temporary relief, but perfect relief, perfect forgiveness, perfect rightness with God. His work, in contrast to the shadows of old, can perfect the conscience. It can provide perfect relief. It can clear the guilt of sin. That's a strong promise. The new order does not function like the here we go again nature of the old. It is finished. So Jesus cries from the cross. Not only is Jesus' act finished, but so too can be our incessant striving to find a way to be right with God. So what? Three exhortations to you, church. Number one, resist the lure of temporary sources of relief. Resist the shiny trinkets that overpromise and underdeliver. Friends, there is an odd tendency lodged in the human heart. And it is the tendency that the whole of the book of Hebrews is warning us against. We tend to gravitate to things that we can see, touch, taste, and smell. We look to those things to make us feel like I'm right with God. So for former Jews, the reality was they could be right with God on the basis of Jesus' work and not because of ceremonial washings or dietary laws or Sabbath regulations, all that. This is unfathomable. So the temptation is just like worshiping the pagan gods, to tack Jesus onto the pantheon of other good practices that you are doing. In the Jewish system, this would mean placing Jesus alongside of these other regulations as one more assurance that I'm right. That my sin is forgiven. Surely, if I'm circumcised and I do the ceremonial washings and I keep the dietary laws and the Sabbath regulations and I have faith in Jesus, then surely I'm good. Surely my sin is forgiven. Our habits may not direct us to the same sources of hope, but we all gravitate towards external symbols to prove to ourselves that our sin is forgiven and we are right with God. I am good with God if I have faith in Jesus and I'm engaged in church and I'm faithful in my spiritual disciplines and I've not raised my voice at my kids this week and it's been a really long time since I looked at pornography and I've taken a meal to care for someone who's suffering and We refer to this as as works righteousness. And at the core of this idea is my right standing with God comes on the basis of things that I do. And at the core, works righteousness always reveals self-righteousness. I'm right with God on the basis of what I do. And here's the problem with Jesus and approaches to justification, to right standing with God. We're always going to gravitate to whatever comes after the and to give ourselves a thumbs up or thumbs down with how we're doing. If it's Jesus and any list of things, your human temptation is always going to be to gravitate to what comes after the and to tell yourself this morning, my sin's forgiven and I'm good. So, like the Israelites of old, our consciences are always going to have temporary relief. Because there are always going to be more things that we could fill in the blank with. More things that we should do or things that we should stop doing. Friends, there is a vast difference between approaching the activities of faith, the good deeds that we're called to walk in, as acts of worship versus as means of appeasing my conscience and proving to myself that I'm right with God. Only Jesus can do the latter. And Jesus is all you need. Only Jesus, his blood shed for you, can provide the perfect relief that you need. 
which then leads to idea number two. Find satisfaction in the peace that perfect relief provides. Don't look to temporary sources of relief and then train yourself, commit to finding satisfaction in the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because of Jesus' work, through faith, you can be right with God. Hard stop. No, I mean, nothing else after. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have also obtained access through him by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we boast and hope in the glory of God. Paul writing in Romans 5, not only must you learn to avoid seeking hope and false alternatives, but you must also train yourself to believe that Jesus is enough. You're going to have to do this over and over again with your conscience. You're going to do something with it. You're either going to sear it so you become deaf to its voice, or you're going to work it away so you grind yourself up trying to convince yourself that you're okay. Or you're going to find peace with God by training your conscience to look to Jesus and say, I am okay with God because of what Jesus has done on my behalf. Barring the imagery from Lewis' screw tape letters, if I were the devil, my main goal would be to convince Christians that they can never know for sure that they are right with God. Because if I can do that, then I can keep their spirit in constant state of agitation where they neither experience joy or contentment because they always feel like they must do more, earn more, or work more. Bunyan, it's not my good frame of heart that made my righteousness better, nor my bad frame that made my righteousness worse. My righteousness was Jesus Christ himself, and he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Find contentment, peace, joy there. Lastly, use hard circumstances and sinful choices to point others to the source of perfect relief. Use hard circumstances and sinful choices to point others to the source of perfect relief. Friends, I want you to consider how you give counsel and care to others when they sin, when they are sinned against, or when they face the sin of a fallen world. Where, or more specifically, to whom do you point them? A couple of decades of pastoral ministry, and I can't count the number of times people who intend to do good, but whose instincts push them towards counseling others with sources of temporary relief. Sure, you can take a high dose of pain medicine to take the edge off for a while, but unless you address the underlying cause of your anguish, given enough time, you're going to be right back in the same place. So when someone comes to you and confesses some manner of sin, their conscience is gnawing at them and they need relief. Friends, our prescription here is critical. Well, brother, I really think you should just be more active in your local church. Or, or, or sister, maybe if you would just, had just been more consistent in your morning Bible reading. Or even worse, boy, your husband really is a mess. Let, let's pray that something changes with him so you guys can get back on the right track. You could fill in the blank with innumerable good, well-meaning techniques that, if applied, may provide some temporary relief. Or you could point people to Jesus. And it's worth stealing the thunder of where this sermon is going in the book of Hebrews. You remember the speaker's charge? Remember where we're going to go in Hebrews 12? Look to Jesus the author and perfecter of the faith. This is the crescendo of the sermon. This is the central point. It is so simple. He says, look to Jesus. Does your counsel sound like that? Look to a source of perfect relief. Find a God who so loved the world that he sent his son, the God-man Jesus Christ, to shed his blood so that your sin might be forgiven by faith. Bask in the undeserved merit that comes to you from a fount filled with blood that flows from Emmanuel's veins. 
rest in the work Jesus finished, and there find hope and help in your time of need. Does your counsel sound like that? If not, it may be illustrative that you don't talk to yourself that way. So train yourself to look to Jesus, and you're going to be far more apt to point other people to look to Jesus. And there, find perfect relief. Friends, let's use our time to end this morning by treasuring that perfect relief that comes from true forgiveness and offering a word of prayer and then a song of praise to our great God after we celebrate the Lord's Supper together. So would you bow with me as we pray? Give you a moment of private, personal reflection and prayer, and then I'll voice a prayer for us, and then Pastor Brandon's going to come and lead us to take the Lord's Supper together. Our God, we are deeply thankful that you have not left us only with sources of temporary relief for our sin. We're so grateful that on this side of Jesus' activity, we can look to a source of perfect relief. That we can, through faith, know that our sins are forgiven. Know that we've been justified, that we've been made right with you not because of works we've done in righteousness, but because of the work of Christ. We thank you for your kindness and providing tangible symbols for us that help us grapple with the deep truths of the scriptures. We thank you most of all for the person of Christ, one who did for us what we could not do for ourselves and offers to us perfect relief, perfect forgiveness and a right standing with you. We pray that you might make us the kinds of people who hope in that reality. Would you train our hearts and our affections towards Christ as we deal with our sin and with the sin of others? Might you deepen our affections for what Jesus has done on our behalf? Train us to look to Jesus, and there find mercy and help in our time of need. As we come to your table now, we're reminded of the once and for all sacrifice of Christ. We ask that that might compel us to love him more. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.